Christianity and Law The Influence of Christianity on the Development of English Common Law Stephen C. Perks Kuiper Foundation Taunton, England Narrated by Nathan F. Conkey for LRNTeach.com with the full permission of the author. Copyright Stephen C. Perks Preface to the Second Edition The following essay on the influence of Christianity on the development of English common law was originally presented as a paper in the early 1990s at a national conference of Christian organisations concerned about maintaining the relevance and influence of the Christian faith and Christian moral standards in modern British society. It was subsequently published as a monograph by Avant Books in 1993. In the 19 years since it was originally published, the deterioration of the nation's legal and political institutions and the decline of the moral life of the people has continued to such an extent that we now find ourselves in a situation that can only be described as nothing short of a national apostasy. The declension of the nation from the Christian faith, which was observable throughout most of the 20th century, has become exponential at the beginning of the 21st century. On the 28th of February 2001, two High Court judges, Lord Justice Munby and Mr Justice Beeston, delivered a judgment in which they made the following claim. We cannot avoid the need to restate what ought to be, but seemingly are not, well understood principles regulating the relationship of religion and law in our society. We live in this country in a democratic and pluralistic society, in a secular state, not a theocracy. Although historically this country is part of the Christian West, and although it has an established church which is Christian, there have been enormous changes in the social and religious life of our country over the last century. Our society is now pluralistic and largely secular. But one aspect of its pluralism is that we also now live in a multicultural community of many faiths. One of the paradoxes of our lives is that we live in a society which has, at one and the same time, become both increasingly secular, but also increasingly diverse in its religious affiliation. We sit as secular judges, serving a multicultural community of many faiths. We are sworn, we quote the judicial oath, to do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm, without fear or favour, affection or ill will. But the laws and usages of the realm do not include Christianity in whatever form. The aphorism that Christianity is part of the common law of England is mere rhetoric. These words demonstrate clearly enough the degree to which our legal institutions are being secularised by contemporary judges, but they reveal also a formidable ignorance regarding the nature of English law generally. Is it really the case that the laws and usages of the realm do not include Christianity in whatever form? By no means. The law of the Church of England is still part of the law of the land. The Church of England as a whole and each of its component institutions are subject to a variety of laws, rules and norms, some imposed by the state, some made by the Church with the concurrence of the state and others created internally by the Church itself at national, provincial and diocesan level. The laws applicable to the Church of England are to be found in Acts of Parliament, in measures and canons, in a variety of rules and regulations, in the common law of England as revealed in the judgments of ecclesiastical and temporal courts, in custom, and in divine or natural law. The law of the Church of England is part of the law of the land. As Uthwart J stated in Attorney General v. Dean and Chapter of Ripon Cathedral, the law is one, but jurisdiction as to its enforcement is divided between the ecclesiastical courts and the temporal courts, Regarding English law more generally, we must remember that as late as 1953, Queen Elizabeth II, as part of her coronation oath, swore to maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel, 
and the Protestant Reformed religion established by law. Constitutionally, nothing has changed since then with regard to the position occupied by the Church of England in particular and the Christian religion established by law more generally. Perhaps if the learned judges had quoted more of the judicial oath to which they refer and incorrectly understand as binding them to the principles of secularism, the inconsistency, indeed the absurdity of their views and the delinquency of their judgment would have been immediately apparent. The judicial oath requires those who take it to say the following, I do swear by Almighty God that I will well and truly serve our sovereign, Lady Queen Elizabeth II, in the office of, and I will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm, without fear or favour, affection or ill will. Lord Justice Munby and Mr Justice Beeston have sworn, by Almighty God, to serve Queen Elizabeth II as a Christian Queen, who herself has sworn to maintain the laws of God, the true profession of the gospel and the Protestant Reformed religion established by law. In what sense, therefore, does the judicial oath require them to enshrine the principles of secularism in their judgments? In no sense. What it requires them to do is administer the law of the land impartially as servants of Queen Elizabeth II. The secular principles to which the judges claim to adhere are religious principles that run counter to the religious principles upon which the law of the land is ultimately based, and in championing such principles in their judgments, they are failing in their duty to serve Queen Elizabeth II in accordance with the oath they have sworn by Almighty God. It is true, of course, that modern Britain has embraced secularism and multiculturalism, and there is a growing institutionalised antipathy to the Christian religion, evidence of which can be seen, for example, in perverse judgments of the modern judiciary, such as the one referred to above. But what this reveals is not that modern Britain is no longer a Christian nation. Rather, it reveals that modern Britain is an apostate nation. It is the purpose of this monograph to demonstrate that the aphorism Christianity is part of the common law of England, is by no means mere rhetoric, but indeed profoundly true. National apostasy does not alter our history, nor in itself does it alter the Constitution, no matter how much our judges may like to think that it does. The answer to this apostasy, therefore, is not the secularisation of our laws, but national repentance and a return to the Christian principles of justice that underpinned our law and guided the nation for so long. The text is substantially the same as that published in 1993. I have added very little other than to make minor alterations to grammar and correct a few typographical errors. Stephen C. Perks, September 2012 Christianity and Law The Influence of Christianity on the Development of English Common Law Summary For the purpose of this essay, Arthur Ho's definition of common law as the body of rules prescribing social conduct and justiciable in the royal courts of England has been adopted. This definition does not include the courts of equity, however. English common law evolved out of the practice of the royal courts, which administered a body of rules common to the whole realm in the period following the Norman Conquest. Its sources, however, go back to the pre-Norman laws and customs of England. With the arrival of Augustine's mission in 597 and the subsequent conversion of Ethelbert to the Christian faith, England came under the influence of the Christian religion and the laws of the Anglo-Saxon kings reveal increasingly throughout the second half of the first millennium the strong influence of biblical ideals and law. This is particularly noticeable with Alfred and his successors, who held up the Mosaic law as the ideal that the nation must follow if it is to be blessed by God. Heathen practices were forbidden, and those who continued in them were commanded to cease or leave the country with their possessions and their sins. The church was protected by law, granted immunity from taxation, 
and the clergy became important members of the king's witan, council, church and royal law were not separated and the king ruled as head of state and church, making laws for both. As a result, Germanic practices and norms were modified under the influence of Christianity and many elements of social life and judicial procedure incompatible with Christianity became obsolete. The Anglo-Saxon understanding of moral responsibility and legal liability acquired a Christian meaning. After the Norman conquest, many of the pre-Norman dooms and customs of Anglo-Saxon England remained in force, but were modified and transformed to meet the contemporary situation. The Normans provided a strong central government, and as the administration of justice in royal courts by royal justices increased, the old courts of Shire and Hundred and the feudal courts declined in importance. The new situation created by the Norman presence, along with the ascendancy of the royal courts drawing on pre-Norman laws and customs, led to the creation of the common law. Church and lay jurisdictions were separated, however, but the church continued to exercise a strong influence on the lay courts in an indirect manner. After the papal revolution, late 11th and early 12th centuries, the canonists developed an integrated and complex system of canon law applicable in the ecclesiastical courts. This was the first modern Western legal system. The secular state imitated this in many important ways, adopting aspects of both the legal theory and procedure of canon law. English common law, however, did not come under the controlling influence of Roman law. The theology of Western Christendom played an important part in shaping legal theory in the West generally. The Western theory of retributive justice was a result of developments in theology following the Papal Revolution, particularly Anselm's theory of the Atonement. Modern theories of legal representation, taking of oaths before giving testimony, the emphasis on judicial investigation and rules for determining the relevance of evidence were all developed and practiced first in the ecclesiastical courts and later adopted by the lay courts. The influence of Christianity mitigated many pagan and barbaric elements of pre-Christian judicial procedure, such as the ordeal, modifying them according to biblical principles and eventually leading to their abandonment. Furthermore, in the first half of the second millennium, morality and law were not so sharply distinguished and human law was subject to the requirement that it should conform to reason and the law of God, which were then considered to be practically the same thing. This remained the case even after case law and precedent came to dominate the common law system. In equity also, the common rule was that no law is just or binding if it contravenes reason or the law of God. The common law system was developed during the 12th and 13th centuries by the royal judges, who were mostly ecclesiastics. The law and customs of England, which were themselves strongly influenced by Christianity during the second half of the first millennium, were transformed into the common law system during the first half of the second millennium by Christian judges, under the influence of the church and Christian ideals. The Church also provided in many respects a model of government for the secular state. The English legal system was formed and developed over centuries under the dominating influence of the Christian religion. Our system of justice is what it is and distinguishable from other far less civilised systems because of the influence and input that the Christian religion has brought to it. Now, however, the Christian presuppositions upon which the law was built and upon which it relied for its validity and authority are being abandoned by the people and by their legislators and judges. And as a result, the traditional understanding of the rule of law, which guided the nation for so long, is being overturned in favour of the rule of politicians who legislate in terms of pragmatic principles rather than Christian ideals. Our legislators no longer recognise the authority of a higher law to which all human law must conform if it is to be valid. Consequently, 
Christian law is being replaced by law based on religious and philosophical presuppositions that are alien to our legal traditions. For over a thousand years, the Christian faith influenced and helped to shape English law, and the law underpinned the nation's Christian heritage. Both are now in ruins. The remedy for this malady lies in recognising once more that all human law must conform to the standards of justice revealed in God's law, definition of common law. The term common law can have a number of different meanings, depending on its context. In a very broad sense, the term can mean the legal system and habits of legal thought that Englishmen have evolved. In this sense, it is contrasted with systems of law derived from Roman law. In a narrower sense, it refers to those laws that are common to the whole of the kingdom and derived from common usage and custom. In this sense, it contrasts with whatever is particular, extraordinary and special, whether that distinctiveness is due to geographical, political or other factors. For example, common law is not local law or custom, nor is it mercantile or canon, that is, ecclesiastical law, though the term is derived from the usage of the canonists. Common law derives largely from ancient usage and precedent, though it is anachronistic to apply the term to any period earlier than the 13th century. Common law contrasts with statute law and often means that part of English law, including equity, which is unenacted, especially that contained in the decisions of the courts as opposed to acts of parliament and subordinate legislation. Although generally common law is in origin customary law, it does however comprehend some principles that did not originate in legislation. On the other hand, common law is contrasted with equity, which was administered in the Court of Chancery. Equity is applied where common law and the precedents established under it are not able to provide a framework for justice in particular or special circumstances. It is clear from this that a simple, trouble-free definition of common law is not easy. Writing of the 12th and 13th centuries, Arthur Hogue defines common law in a broad sense as the body of rules prescribing social contact and justiciable in the royal courts of England. For our purposes we shall use this definition of common law since our concern is not with a more narrow or particular definition and understanding of common law, but rather with the influence of Christianity and biblical principles of justice upon the development of English law. This definition does not embrace the Court of Chancery, which was the principal court of equity, or Star Chamber. The Origin of Common Law the dating of the development of common law usually begins with the Norman Conquest. Over the two centuries that followed 1066, the Norman and Angevin kings slowly established a system of royal courts that administered justice across the whole realm, according to a common body of laws. Prior to this development, the principal courts in existence were the communal courts of Shire and Hundred and the feudal courts of the landowners. However, the sources of English common law go back to pre-Norman times and were embodied in local customs, which at many points differed between the kingdoms of Wessex, Mercia and Danelaw, and the dooms of the English kings going back to Alfred. As a result of the Norman conquest and the establishment of royal courts throughout the kingdom over the following centuries, these local customs were unified under one system of law common to all men, later called the common law. The jurisdiction of the Shire, Hundred and Feudal Courts was not abolished formally, but rather declined as the jurisdiction of the royal courts increased. Before looking at the emergence of the common law during this period, we shall look at the influence of Christianity and biblical law on English law prior to the Norman Conquest.